following is a presentation of Henri Bergson's Time and Free Will from Noetic Series, LLC, copyright 2020. This is read by Luke Johnson. The copy I'll be using is the London George Allen and Company Limited Ruskin House 44 and 45 Rathbone Place, New York, the Macmillan Company, 1913. Time and Free Will, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness by Henri Bergson, member of the Institute, professor at the Collège de France. Authorized translation by F. L. Pogson, M. A. London, George Allen and Company Limited, Ruskin House, Forty Four and Forty Five Rathbone Place, New York, The Macmillan Company, Nineteen Thirteen. Πυρία εψιλον της δέλτα τάφνη φύσην ριτοτίνος με και οποία ετορωτούς θέλει παίν πυρία λέγεν. Πιν χειρόνι μήνει μύρο, δαλάβε συνέενε κυρία Ατσιο, σπεργάμα σχιωπό κυρία ο κύου παεθείς με λέγιν. Πλατίνας, τρανσλέσιον. And if the nature of the nature of what I said, he would ask them, and say, if he said, he would not ask, but he would be silent, and I would be silent, and I would not be silent. Translator's Preface Henri-Louis Bagson was born in Paris, October 18, 1859. He entered the École Normale in 1878 and was admitted Agrégé de Philosophie in 1881 and Doctor et Lettres in 1889. After holding professorships in various provincial and provision lycees, he became maître de conférences at the École Normale Supérieure in 1897, and since 1900 has been professor at the Collège de France. In 1901, he became a member of the Institute on his election to the Académie des Sciences Morales et Politiques. A full list of Professor Bergson's works is given in the appended bibliography. In making the following translation of his Essay sur les données immédiates de la conscience, I have had the great advantage of his cooperation at every stage, and the aid which he has given has been most generous and untiring. The book itself was worked out and written during the years 1883 to 1887, and was originally published in 1889. The footnotes in the French edition contain a certain number of references to French translations of English works. In the present translation, I am responsible for citing these references from the original English. This will account for the fact that editions are sometimes referred to, which have appeared subsequently to 1889. I have also added fairly extensive marginal summaries and a full index. In France, the essay is already in its seventh edition. Indeed, one of the most striking facts about Professor Bergson's works is the extent to which they have appealed not only to the professional philosophers, but also to the ordinary cultivated public. The method which he pursues is not the conceptual and abstract method which has been the dominant tradition in philosophy. For him, reality is not to be reached by any elaborate construction of thought. It is given in immediate experience as a flux, a continuous process of becoming to be grasped by intuition by sympathetic insight. Concepts break up the continuous flow of reality into parts external to one another. They further the interests of language and social life 
and are useful primarily for practical purposes, but they give us nothing of the life and movement of reality, rather by substituting for this an artificial reconstruction. A patchwork of dead fragments, they lead to the difficulties which have always beset the intellectualist philosophy and which on its premises are insoluble. Instead of attempting a solution in the intellectualist sense, Professor Begson calls upon his readers to put these broken fragments of reality behind them, to immerse themselves in the living stream of things, and to find their difficulties swept away in its resistless flow. In the present volume, Professor Bergson first deals with the intensity of conscious states. He shows the quantitative differences are applicable only to magnitudes, that is, in the last resort to space, and that intensity in itself is purely qualitative, passing then from the consideration of separate conscious states to their multiplicity. He finds that there are two forms of multiplicity. Quantitative or discrete multiplicity involves the intuition of space, but the multiplicity of conscious states is wholly qualitative. This unfolding multiplicity constitutes duration, which is a succession without distinction. An interpenetration of elements so heterogeneous that former states can never recur. The idea of a homogeneous and measurable time is shown to be an artificial concept formed by the intrusion of the idea of space into the realm of pure duration. Indeed, the whole of Professor Begzon's philosophy centers around his conception of real concrete duration and the specific feeling of duration which our consciousness has when it does away with convention and habit and gets back to its natural attitude. At the root of most errors in philosophy, he finds a confusion between this concrete duration and the abstract time, which mathematics, physics, and even language and common sense substitute for it. Applying these results to the problem of free will, he shows that the difficulties arise from taking up one stand after the act has been performed and applying the conceptual method to it. From the point of view of the living, developing self, these difficulties are shown to be illusory. And freedom, though not definable in abstract or conceptual terms, is declared to be one of the clearest facts established by observation. It is no doubt misleading to attempt to sum up a system of philosophy in in a sentence, but perhaps some part of the spirit of Professor Bergson's philosophy may be gathered from the motto which, with his permission, I have prefixed to this translation. If a man were to inquire of nature the reason of her creative activity, and if she were willing to give ear and answer, she would say, Ask me not, but understand in silence, even as I am silent and am not wont to speak. F. L. Pogson, Oxford, June 1910. Bibliography one works by Bergson. A books. These are primarily in French. And uh, given that I don't speak French, I will not mutilate pronunciation. I advise looking at the hard copy uh, if you are so interested. And then we have two select list of books and articles dealing in whole or in part with Bergson and his philosophy arranged alphabetically under each language. Again, I will spare you the mutilation of French and whatever other languages are here so we can get right into the argument and arc of the text. Author's Preface We necessarily express ourselves by means of words, and we usually think in terms of space. 
That is to say, language requires us to establish between our ideas the same sharp and precise distinctions, the same discontinuity as between material objects. This assimilation of thought to things is useful in practical life and necessary in most of the sciences. But it may be asked whether the insurmountable difficulties presented by certain philosophical problems do not arise from our placing side by side in space phenomena which do not occupy space, and whether by merely getting rid of the clumsy symbols round which we are fighting, we might not bring the fight to an end. When an illegitimate translation of the unextended into the extended of quality into quantity has introduced contradiction into the very heart of the question, contradiction must, of course, recur in the answer. The problem which I have chosen is one which is common to metaphysics and psychology, the problem of free will. What I attempt to prove is that all discussion between the determinists and their opponents implies a previous confusion of duration with extensity, of succession with simultaneity, of quality with quantity. This confusion, once dispelled, we may perhaps witness the disappearance of the objections raised against free will, of the definitions given of it, and, in a certain sense, of the problem of free will itself. To prove this is the object of the third part of the present volume. The first two chapters, which treat of the conceptions of intensity and duration, have been written as an introduction to the third. Henri Bergson, February 1888 Contents, Chapter 1 The Intensity of Psychic States Quantitative differences applicable to magnitudes but not to intensities. 1 through 4. Attempt to estimate intensities by objective causes or atomic movements. 4 through 7. Different kinds of intensities. 7. Deep seated psychic states. Desire. 8. Hope. 9. Joy and sorrow. 10. Aesthetic feelings. 11 through 18. Grace. 12. Beauty. 14 through 18. Music, poetry, art, attention, and muscular tension. 27 through 28. Violent emotions. 29 through 31. Rage. 29. Fear. 30. Affective sensations. 32 through 39. Pleasure and pain, 33 through 39. Disgust, 36. Representative sensations, 39 through 60. And external causes, 42. Sensation of sound, 43. Intensity pitch and muscular effort, 45 through 46. Sensations of heat and cold, 46 through 47. Sensations of pressure and weight, 47 through 50. Sensation of light, 50 through 60. Photometric experiments 52 through 60, De Boeuf's experiments 56 through 60, Psychophysics 60 through 72, Weber and Fechner 61 through 65, De Boeuf 67 through 70, The Mistake of Regarding Sensations as Magnitude 70 through 72, Intensity in 1 Representative 2 Affective States, Intensity and Multiplicity 72 through 74. Chapter 2, The Multiplicity of Conscious States, The Idea of Duration, Number and Its Units, 75-77, through 77. Number and Accompanying Intuition of Space, 78-85, through 85. Two Kinds of Multiplicity of Material Objects and Conscious States, 85-87, through 87. Impenetrability of Matter, 88-89, through 89. Homogeneous Time and Pure Duration, 90-91, through 91. Space and its contents, 92. Empirical theories of space, 93 through 94. Intuition of empty homogeneous medium peculiar to man, 95 through 97. Time as homogeneous medium reducible to space, 98 through 99. Duration, succession, and space, 
100 to 104 pure duration. 105 to 106 is duration measurable. 107 to 110 is motion measurable. 111 to 112, paradox of the Iliatics. 113 to 115, duration and simultaneity. 115 to 116, velocity and simultaneity. 117 to 119, space alone, homogeneous duration and succession belong to conscious mind. 120 to 121, two kinds of multiplicity, qualitative and quantitative. 121 to 123. Superficial psychic states invested with discontinuity of their external causes, 124 to 126. These eliminated real duration is felt as a quality, 127 to 128. The two aspects of the self on the surface, well-defined conscious states, deeper down states which interpenetrate and form organic whole, 129 to 139. Solidifying influence of language on sensation, 129 to 132. Analysis distorts the feelings, 132 to 34. Deeper conscious states forming a part of ourselves, 134 to 136. Problem soluble only by recourse to the concrete and living self, 137 to 139. Pages 75 through 139. Chapter 3 The Organization of Conscious States. Free will, dynamism and mechanism, 140 to 142, two kinds of determinism, 142, physical determinism, 143 to 155, and molecular theory of matter, 143, and conservation of energy, 144. If conservation, universal, physiological, and nervous phenomena necessitated, but perhaps not conscious states, 145 to 148. But its principle of conversation, Universal. 149. It may not apply to living beings in conscious states. 150 to 154. Idea of its universality depends on confusion between concrete duration and abstract time. 154 to 155. Psychological determinism. 155 to 163. Implies associationist conception of mind. 155 to 158. This involves defective conception of self, 159 to 163. The free act, freedom as expressing the fundamental self, 165 to 170. Real duration and contingency, 172 to 182. Could our act have been different, 172 to 175. Geometrical representation of process of coming to a decision, 175 to 178. The fallacies to which it leads determinists and libertarians, 179 to 183. Real duration and prediction, 183 to 198. Conditions of Paul's prediction of Peter's action, 1. Being Peter, 2. Knowing already his final act, 184 to 189. The three fallacies involved, 190 to 192. Astronomical prediction depends on hypothetical acceleration of movements, 193 to 195. Duration cannot be thus accelerated, 196 to 198. Real duration and causality, 199 to 221. The law, same antecedents, same consequence, 199 to 201. Causality as regular secession, 202 to 203. Causality as prefiguring two kinds. One, prefiguring as mathematical preexistence implies non-duration, but we endure and therefore may be free, 204 to 210. Two, prefiguring as having idea of future act to be realized by effort does not involve determinism. 211 to 214. Determinism results from confusing these two senses. 215 to 218. Freedom real but indefinable. 219 to 221. Pages 140 to 221. Conclusion. States of self perceived through forms borrowed from external world. 223. Intensity as quality. 225. Duration as qualitative multiplicity, 226. No duration in the external world, 227. Extensity and duration must be separated, 229. Only the fundamental self free, 231. Kant's mistaken idea of time as homogeneous, 232. Hence, he put the self which is free outside both space and time, 233. 
Duration is heterogeneous. Relation of psychic state to act is unique and act is free. 235 to 240. Pages 222 to 240. Index. Chapter 1. The Intensity of Psychic States. It is usually admitted that states of consciousness, sensations, feelings, passions, efforts, are capable of growth and diminution. We are even told that a sensation can be said to be twice, thrice, four times as intense as another sensation of the same kind. This latter thesis, which is maintained by psychophysicists, we shall examine later. But even the opponents of psychophysics do not see any harm in speaking of one sensation as being more intense than another, of one effort as being greater than another, and in thus setting up differences of quantity between purely internal states. Common sense, moreover, has not the slightest hesitation in giving its verdict on this point. People say they are more or less warm, or more or less sad, and this distinction of more and less, even when it is carried over, to the region of subjective facts and unextended objects surprises nobody, but this involves a very obscure point and a much more important problem than is usually supposed. When we assert that one number is greater than another number or one body greater than another body, we know very well what we mean. Section 2. Such differences applicable to magnitudes but not to intensities. For in both cases we allude to unequal spaces, as shall be shown in detail a little further on. And we call that space the greater which contains the other. But how can a more intense sensation contain one of less intensity? Shall we say that the first implies the second, that we reach the sensation of higher intensity only on condition of having first passed through the less intense stages of the same sensation, and that in a certain sense we are concerned here also with the relation of container to contained? This conception of intensive magnitude seems, indeed, to be that of common sense. But we cannot advance it as a philosophical explanation without becoming involved in a vicious circle. For it is beyond doubt that in the natural series of numbers, the later number exceeds the earlier, but the very possibility of arranging the numbers in ascending order arises from their having to each other relations of container and contained, so that we feel ourselves able to explain precisely in what sense one is greater than the other. The question then is how we succeed in forming a series of this kind with intensities, which cannot be superposed on each other and by what sign we recognize that the members of this series increase. For example, instead of diminishing, but this always comes back to the inquiry, why an intensity can be assimilated to a magnitude. Alleged distinction between two kinds of quantity, extensive and intensive magnitude. It is only to evade the difficulty to distinguish, as is usually done, between two species of quantity, the first extensive and measurable, the second intensive and not admitting of measure, but of which it can nevertheless be said that it is greater or less than another intensity. For it is recognized thereby that there is something common to these two forms of magnitude, since they are both termed magnitudes and declared to be equally capable of increase in 
diminution. But from the point of view of magnitude, what can there be in common between the extensive and the intensive, the extended and the unextended, if in the first case we call that which contains the other the greater quantity? Why go on speaking of quantity and magnitude when there is no longer a container or a contained? If a quantity can increase and diminish, if we perceive in it, so to speak, the less inside the more, is not such a quantity on this very account divisible, and thereby extended? Is it not, then, a contradiction to speak of an inextensive quantity? But yet, common sense agrees with the philosophers, in setting up a pure intensity as a magnitude, just as if it were something extended. And not only do we use the same word, but whether we think of a greater intensity or a greater extensity, we experience in both cases an analogous impression. The terms greater and less call up in both cases the same idea. If we now ask ourselves, in what does this idea consist, our consciousness still offers us the image of a container in a contained. We picture to ourselves, for example, a greater intensity of effort as a greater length of thread rolled up or as a spring which, in unwinding, will occupy a greater space. In the idea of intensity, and even in the word which expresses it, we shall find the image of a present contraction and consequently a future expansion, the image of something virtually extended, and if we may say so, of a compressed space. We are thus led to believe that we translate the intensive into the extensive and that we compare two intensities, or at least express the comparison by the confused intuition of a relation between two extensities, but it is just the nature of this operation which it is difficult to determine. Attempt to distinguish intensities by objective causes, but we judge of intensity without knowing magnitude or nature of the cause. The solution which occurs immediately to the mind once it has entered upon this path consists in defining the intensity of a sensation, or of any state whatever of the ego, by the number and magnitude of the objective, and therefore measurable causes which have given rise to it. Doubtless a more intense sensation of light is the one which has been obtained or is obtainable by means of a larger number of luminous sources provided they be at the same distance and identical with one another. But in the immense majority of cases, we decide about the intensity of the effect without even knowing the nature of the cause, much less its magnitude. Indeed, it is the very intensity of the effect which often leads us to venture an hypothesis as to the number and nature of the causes and thus to revise the judgment of our senses, which at first represented them as insignificant. And it is no use arguing that we are then comparing the actual state of the ego with some previous state in which the cause was perceived in its entirety at the same time as its effect was experienced. No doubt this is our procedure in a fairly large number of cases, but we cannot then explain the differences of intensity which we recognize between deep-seated psychic phenomena, the cause of which is within us and not outside. On the other hand, we are never so bold in judging the intensity of a psychic state as when the subjective aspect of the phenomena is the only one to strike us, or when the external cause to which we refer it does not easily admit of measurement. Thus it seems evident that we experience a more intense pain at the pulling of a tooth than of a hair. The artist knows without the possibility of doubt 
that the picture of a master affords him more intense pleasure than the signboard of a shop. And there is not the slightest need ever to have heard of forces of cohesion to assert that we expand less effort in bending a steel blade than a bar of iron. Thus, the comparison of two intensities is usually made without the least appreciation of the number of causes, their mode of action, or their extent. Attempt to distinguish intensities by atomic movements, but it is the sensation which is given to consciousness and not the movement. There is still room, it is true, for an hypothesis of the same nature, but more subtle. We know that mechanical and especially kinetic theories aim at explaining the visible and sensible properties of bodies by well defined movements of their ultimate parts. And many of us foresee the time when the intensive differences of qualities, that is to say, of our sensations, will be reduced to extensive differences between the changes taking place behind them. May it not be maintained that, without knowing these theories, we have a vague surmise of them, that behind the more intense sound we guess the presence of ampler vibrations which are propagated in the disturbed medium, and that it is with a reference to this mathematical relation, precise in itself though confusedly perceived, that we assert the higher intensity of a particular sound? Without even going so far, could it not be laid down that every state of consciousness corresponds to a certain disturbance of the molecules and atoms of the cerebral substance, and that the intensity of a sensation measures the amplitude, the complication, or the extent of these molecular movements. This last hypothesis is at least as probable as the other, but it no more solves the problem, for quite possibly the intensity of a sensation bears witness to a more or less considerable work accomplished in our organism. But it is the sensation which is given to us in consciousness, and not this mechanical work. Indeed, it is by the intensity of the sensation that we judge of the greater or less amount of work accomplished. Intensity then remains, at least apparently, a property of sensation. And still the same question recurs. Why do we say of a higher intensity that it is greater? Why do we think of a greater quantity? Or a greater space. Side note different kinds of intensities. One, deep seated psychic states. Two, muscular effort. Intensity is more easily definable in the former case. Perhaps the difficulty of the problem lies chiefly in the fact that we call by the same name and picture to ourselves in the same way intensities which are very different in nature, e.g. the intensity of a feeling and that of a sensation or an effort. The effort is accompanied by a muscular sensation, and the sensations themselves are connected with certain physical conditions which probably count for something in the estimate of their intensity. We have here to do with phenomena which take place on the surface of consciousness and which are always connected, as we shall see further on, with the perception of a movement or of an external object. But certain states of the soul seem to us, rightly or wrongly, to be self-sufficient, such as deep joy or sorrow, a reflective passion or an aesthetic emotion. Pure intensity ought to be more easily definable in these simple cases where no extensive elements seems to be involved. We shall see, in fact, that it is reducible here to a certain quality or shade, which spreads over a more or less considerable mass of psychic states. Or, if the expression be preferred to the larger or smaller number of simple states which make up the fundamental emotion. Take, for example, the progress of a desire. 
For example, an obscure desire gradually becomes a deep passion. Now you will see that the feeble intensity of this desire consisted at first in its appearing to be isolated and, as it were, foreign to the remainder of your inner life. But little by little, it permeates a larger number of psychic elements, tinging them, so to speak, with its own color, and lo, your outlook on the whole of your surroundings seems now to have changed radically. How do you become aware of a deep passion once it has taken hold of you, if not by perceiving that the same objects no longer impress you in the same manner? All your sensations and all your ideas seem to brighten up. It is like childhood back again. We experience something of the kind in certain dreams, in which we do not imagine anything out of the ordinary, and yet through which there resounds an indescribable note of originality. The fact is that the further we penetrate into the depths of consciousness, the less right we have to treat psychic phenomena as things which are set side by side. When it is said that an object occupies a large space in the soul, or even that it fills it entirely, we ought to understand by this simply that its image has altered the shade of a thousand perceptions or memories, and that in this sense it pervades them, although it does not itself come into view. But this wholly dynamic way of looking at things is repugnant to the reflective consciousness, because the latter delights in clean-cut distinctions, which are easily expressed in words and in things with well-defined outlines, like those which are perceived in space. It will assume, then, that everything else remaining identical, such and such a desire has gone up a scale of magnitudes, as though it were permissible still to speak of magnitude, where there is neither multiplicity nor space. But just as consciousness, as will be shown later on, concentrates on a given point of the organism, the increasing number of muscular contractions which take place on the surface of the body thus converting them into one single feeling of effort, of growing intensity, so it will hypostatize, under the form of a growing desire, the gradual alterations which take place in the confused heap of coexisting psychic states. But that is a change of quality, rather than of magnitude. What makes hope such an intense pleasure is the fact that the future, which we dispose of to our liking, appears to us at the same time under a multitude of forms, especially attractive and equally possible, even if the most coveted of these becomes realized. It will be necessary to give up the others, and we shall have lost a great deal. The idea of the future pregnant with an infinity of possibilities is thus more fruitful than the future itself, and this is why we find more charm and hope than in possession, in dreams, than in reality. The emotions of joy and sorrow, their successive stages correspond to qualitative changes in the whole of our psychic states. Let us try to discover the nature of an increasing intensity of joy or sorrow in the exceptional cases, where no physical symptom intervenes. Neither inner joy nor passion is an isolated inner state, which at first occupies a corner of the soul and gradually spreads. At its lowest level, it is very like a turning of our states of consciousness towards the future. Then, as if their weight were diminished by this attraction, our ideas and sensations succeed one another with great rapidity. Our movements no longer cost us the same effort. Finally, in cases of extreme joy, our perceptions and memories become tinged with an indefinable quality, as with a kind of heat or light, 
so novel that now and then as we stare at our own self, we wonder how it can really exist. Thus, there are several characteristic forms of purely inward joy, all of which are successive stages corresponding to qualitative alterations in the whole of our psychic states. But the number of states which are concerned with each of these alterations is more or less considerable, and without explicitly counting them, we know very well whether, for example, our joy pervades all the impressions which we receive in the course of the day, or whether any escape from its influence. We thus set up points of division in the interval, which separates two successive forms of joy and this gradual transition from one to the other makes them appear in their turn as different intensities of one and the same feeling, which is thus supposed to change in magnitude. It could be easily shown that the different degrees of sorrow also correspond to qualitative changes. Sorrow begins by being nothing more than a facing towards the past, and impoverishment of our sensations and ideas, as if each of them were now contained entirely, and the little which it gives out, as if the future were in some way stopped up. And it ends with an impression of crushing failure, the effect of which is that we aspire to nothingness, while every new misfortune, by making us understand better the uselessness of the struggle, causes us a bitter pleasure. The aesthetic feelings, their increasing intensities are really different feelings. The aesthetic feelings offer us a still more striking example of this progressive stepping in of new elements, which can be detected in the fundamental emotion and which seem to increase its magnitude. Although in reality, they do nothing more than alter its nature. Let us consider the simplest of them, the feeling of grace. At first, it is only the perception of a certain ease, a certain facility in the outward movements, and as those movements are easy which prepare the way for others, we are led to find a superior ease in the movements, which can be foreseen. In the present attitudes in which future attitudes are pointed out, and as it were prefigured. If jerky movements are wanting in grace, the reason is that each of them is self-sufficient and does not announce those which are to follow. If curves are more graceful than broken lines, the reason is that while a curved line changes its direction at every moment, every new direction is indicated in the preceding one. Thus the perception of ease and motion passes over into the pleasure of mastering the flow of time and of holding the future in the present. A third element comes in when the graceful movements submit to a rhythm and are accompanied by music. For the rhythm and measure by allowing us to foresee to a still greater extent the movements of the dancer make us believe that we now control them. As we guess almost the exact attitude which the dancer is going to take, he seems to obey us when he really takes it. The regularity of the rhythm establishes a kind of communication between him and us, and the periodic returns of the measure are like so many invisible threads by means of which we set in motion this imaginary puppet. Indeed, if it stops for an instant, our hand in its impatience cannot refrain from making a movement, as though to push it as though to replace it in the midst of this movement, the rhythm of which has taken complete possession of our thought and will. Thus a kind of physical sympathy enters into the feeling of grace. Now, in analyzing the charm of this sympathy, you will find that it pleases you through its affinity and moral sympathy, the idea of which it subtly suggests. This last element, in which the others are merged after having in a measure ushered it in, explains the irresistible attractiveness of grace. 
We could hardly make out why it affords such pleasure if it were nothing but a saving of effort, as Spencer maintains. But the truth is that in anything which we call very graceful, we imagine ourselves able to detect besides the lightness, which is a sign of mobility, some suggestion of a possible movement towards ourselves, of a virtual and even nascent sympathy. It is this mobile sympathy, always ready to offer itself, which is just the essence of higher grace. Thus, the increasing intensities of aesthetic feeling are here resolved into as many different feelings, each one of which, already heralded by its predecessor, becomes perceptible in it, and then completely eclipses it. It is this qualitative progress which we interpret as a change of magnitude, because we like simple thoughts, and because our language is ill-suited to render the subtleties of psychological analysis. The feeling of beauty art puts to sleep our active and resistant powers and makes us responsive to suggestions. To understand how the feeling of the beautiful itself admits of degrees, we should have to submit it to a minute analysis. Perhaps the difficulty which we experience in defining it is largely owing to the fact that we look upon the beauties of nature as anterior to those of art. The processes of art are thus supposed to be nothing more than means by which the artist expresses the beautiful, and the essence of the beautiful remains unexplained. But we might ask ourselves whether nature is beautiful otherwise than through meeting by chance certain processes of our art, and whether in a certain sense art is not prior to nature. Without even going so far, it seems more in conformity with the rules of a sound method to study the beautiful first in the works in which it has been produced by a conscious effort, and then to pass on by imperceptible steps from art to nature, which may be looked upon as an artist in its own way. By placing ourselves at this point of view, we shall perceive that the object of art is to put to sleep the active or rather resistant powers of our personality, and thus to bring us into a state of perfect responsiveness in which we realize the idea that is suggested to us and sympathize with the feeling that is expressed. In the processes of art, we shall find in a weakened form a refined and in some measure spiritualized version of the processes commonly used to induce the state of hypnosis. Thus, in music, the rhythm and measure suspend the normal flow of our sensations and ideas by causing our attention to swing to and fro between fixed points, and they take hold of us with such force that even the faintest imitation of a groan will suffice to fill us with the utmost sadness. If musical sounds affect us more powerfully than the sounds of nature, the reason is that nature confines itself to expressing feelings, whereas music suggests them to us. Whence indeed comes the charm of poetry? The poet is he with whom feelings develop into images, and the images themselves into words which translate them while obeying the laws of rhythm. And seeing these images pass before our eyes, we in our turn experience the feeling which was, so to speak, their emotional equivalent. But we should never realize these images so strongly without the regular movements of the rhythm by which our soul is lulled into self-forgetfulness, and as in a dream, thinks and sees with the poet. The plastic arts obtain an effect of the same kind by the fixity which they suddenly impose upon life, and which a physical contagion carries over to the attention of the spectator. While the works of ancient sculpture express faint emotions, which play upon them like a passing breath, the pale immobility of the stone causes the feeling expressed or the movement 
just begun to appear as if they were fixed forever, absorbing our thought and our will in their own eternity. We find in architecture, in the very midst of this startling immobility, certain effects analogous to those of rhythm. The symmetry of form, the indefinite repetition of the same architectural motive, causes our faculty of perception to oscillate between the same and the same again, and gets rid of those customary incessant changes which in ordinary life bring us back without ceasing to the consciousness of our personality. Even the faint suggestion of an idea will then be enough to make the idea fill the whole of our mind. Thus art aims at impressing feelings on us rather than expressing them. It suggests them to us, and willingly dispenses with the imitation of nature when it finds some more efficacious means. Nature, like art, proceeds by suggestion, but does not command the resources of rhythm. It supplies the deficiency by the long comradeship, based on influences received in common by nature and by ourselves, of which the effect is that the slightest indication by nature of a feeling arouses sympathy in our minds, just as a mere gesture on the part of the hypnotist, is enough to force the intended suggestion upon a subject accustomed to his control. And this sympathy is shown in particular when nature displays to us beings of normal proportions, so that our attention is distributed equally over all the parts of the figure, without being fixed on any one of them. Our perceptive faculty then finds itself lulled and soothed by this harmony, and nothing hinders any longer the free play of sympathy, which is ever ready to come forward as soon as the obstacle and its path is removed. Stages in the Aesthetic Emotion It follows from this analysis that the feeling of the beautiful is no specific feeling, but that every feeling experienced by us will assume an aesthetic character, provided that it has been suggested and not caused. It will now be understood why the aesthetic emotion seems to us to admit of degrees of intensity, and also of degrees of elevation. Sometimes the feeling which is suggested scarcely makes a break in the compact texture of psychic phenomena, of which our history consists. Sometimes it draws our attention from them, but not so that they become lost to sight. Sometimes finally it puts itself in their place, engrosses us, and completely monopolizes our soul. There are thus distinct phases in the progress of an aesthetic feeling as in the state of hypnosis, and these phases correspond less to variations of degree than to differences of state or of nature. But the merit of a work of art is not measured so much by the power with which the suggested feeling takes hold of us as by the richness of this feeling itself. In other words, besides degrees of intensity, we instinctively distinguish degrees of depth or elevation. If this last concept be analyzed, it will be seen that the feelings and thoughts which the artist suggests to us express and sum up a more or less considerable part of his history. If the art which gives only sensations is an inferior art, The reason is that analysis often fails to discover, in a sensation, anything beyond the sensation itself. But the greater number of emotions are instinct with a thousand sensations, feelings, or ideas which pervade them. Each one is then a state unique of its kind and indefinable. And it seems that we should have to relive the life of the subject 
who experiences it if we wish to grasp it in its original complexity. Yet the artist aims at giving us a share in this emotion, so rich, so personal, so novel, and at enabling us to experience what he cannot make us understand. This he will bring about by choosing among the outward signs of his emotions, those which our body is likely to imitate mechanically, though slightly, as soon as it perceives them, so as to transport us all once into the indefinable psychological state which called them forth. Thus will be broken down the barrier interposed by time and space between his consciousness and ours, and the richer in ideas and the more pregnant with sensations and emotions is the feeling within whose limits the artist has brought us, the deeper and the higher shall we find the beauty thus expressed. The successive intensities of the aesthetic feeling thus correspond to changes of state occurring in us, and the degrees of depth to the larger or smaller number of elementary psychic phenomena which we dimly discern in the fundamental emotion. The moral feelings, pity, its increasing intensity, is a qualitative progress. The moral feelings might be studied in the same way. Let us take pity as an example. It consists, in the first place, in putting oneself mentally in the place of others, in suffering their pain. But if it were nothing more, as some have maintained, it would inspire us with the idea of avoiding the wretched rather than helping them, for pain is naturally abhorrent to us. This feeling of horror may indeed be at the root of pity, but a new element soon comes in, the need of helping our fellow men and of alleviating their suffering. Shall we say with La Rochefoucauld that this so-called sympathy is a calculation, a shrewd insurance against evils to come, perhaps a dread of some future evil to ourselves, does hold a place in our compassion for other people's evil. These, however, are but lower forms of pity. True pity consists not so much in fearing suffering as in desiring it. The desire is a faint one, and we should hardly wish to see it realized. Yet we form it in spite of ourselves, as if nature were committing some great injustice, and it were necessary to get rid of all suspicion of complicity with her. The essence of pity is thus a need for self-abasement, an aspiration downwards. This painful aspiration nevertheless has a charm about it because it raises us in our own estimation and makes us feel superior to those sensuous goods from which our thought is temporarily detached. The increasing intensity of pity thus consists in a qualitative progress, in a transition from repugnance to fear from fear to sympathy, and from sympathy itself to humility. Conscious states connected with external causes or invoking psychical symptoms? We do not propose to carry this analysis any further. The psychic states whose intensity we have just defined are deep-seated states, which do not seem to have any close relation to their external cause, or to involve the perception of muscular contraction. But such states are rare. There is hardly any passion or desire, any joy or sorrow, which is not accompanied by physical symptoms. And where these symptoms occur, they probably count for something in the estimate of intensities. As for the sensations properly so-called, they are manifestly connected with their external cause. And though the intensity of the sensation cannot be defined by the magnitude of its cause, there undoubtedly exists some relation between these two terms. In some of its manifestations, consciousness even appears to spread outwards, as if intensity were being developed into extensity. E.g., in the case of muscular effort, let us face the last phenomenon at once, we shall thus be transported 
at a bound to the opposed extremity of the series of psychic phenomena. Muscular effort seems at first sight to be quantitative. If there is a phenomena which seems to be presented immediately to consciousness under the form of quantity, or at least of magnitude, it is undoubtedly muscular effort. We picture to our minds a psychic force imprisoned in the soul like the winds in the cave of Aeolus, and only waiting for an opportunity to burst forth. Our will is supposed to watch over this force and from time to time to open a passage for it, regulating the outflow by the effect which it is desired to produce. If we consider the matter carefully, we shall see that this somewhat crude conception of effort plays a large part in our belief in intensive magnitudes. Muscular force, whose sphere of action is space, and which manifests itself in phenomena admitting of measure, seems to us to have existed previous to its manifestations, but in smaller volume, and, so to speak, in a compressed state. Hence, we do not hesitate to reduce this volume more and more, and finally we believe that we can understand how a purely psychic state, which does not occupy space, can nevertheless possess magnitude. Science, too, tends to strengthen the illusion of common sense with regard to this point. Bain, for example, declares that the sensibility accompanying muscular movement coincides with the outgoing stream of nervous energy. It is thus just the emission of nervous force which consciousness perceives. Wundt also speaks of a sensation, central in its origin, accompanying the voluntary innervation of the muscles, and quotes the example of the paralytic, who has a very distinct sensation of the force which he employs in the effort to raise his leg although it remains motionless. Most of the authorities adhere to this opinion, which would be the unanimous view of positive science, were it not that several years ago, Professor William James drew the attention of physiologists to certain phenomena which had been but little remarked, although they were very remarkable. The feeling of effort, we are conscious not of an expenditure of force, but of the resulting muscular movement. When a paralytic strives to raise his useless limb, he certainly does not execute this movement, but with or without his will, he executes another. Some movement is carried out. Somewhere otherwise, there is no sensation of effort. Volpian had already called attention to the fact that if a man affected with hemiplegia is told to clench his paralyzed fist, he unconsciously carries out this action with the fist which is not affected. Ferrier described a still more curious phenomenon. Stretch out your arm while slightly bending your forefinger as if you were going to press the trigger of a pistol. Without moving the finger, without contracting any muscle of the hand, without producing any apparent movement, you will yet be able to feel that you are expending energy. On a closer examination, however, you will perceive that this sensation of effort coincides with the fixation of the muscles of your chest, that you keep your glottis closed and actively contract your respiratory muscles. As soon as respiration resumes its normal course, the consciousness of effort vanishes, unless you really move your finger. These facts already seem to show that we are conscious not of an expenditure of force, but of the movement of the muscles which results from it. The new feature in Professor James's investigation is that he has verified the hypothesis in the case of examples which seem to contradict it absolutely. Thus, when the external rectus muscle of the right eye is paralyzed, the patient tries in vain to turn his eye towards the right, yet objects seem to him to recede towards the right, and since the act of volition has produced no effect, it follows, said Helmholtz, that he is conscious of the effort of volition. But replies, 
Professor James, no account has been taken of what goes on in the other eye. This remains covered during the experiments. Nevertheless, it moves and there is not much trouble in proving that it does. It is the movement of the left eye, perceived by consciousness, which produces the sensation of effort together with the impression that the objects perceived by the right eye are moving. These and similar observations lead Professor James to assert that the feeling of effort is centripetal and not centrifugal. We are not conscious of a force which we are supposed to launch upon our organism. Our feeling of muscular energy at work is a complex afferent sensation, which comes from contracted muscles, stretched ligaments, compressed joints, an immobilized chest, a closed glottis, a knit brow, a clenched jaws, in a word from all the points of the periphery where the effort causes an alteration. Intensity of feeling of effort proportional to extent of our body affected? It is not for us to take a side in the dispute. After all, the question with which we have to deal is not whether the feeling of effort comes from the center or the periphery, but in what does our perception of its intensity exactly consist. Now it is sufficient to observe oneself attentively to reach a conclusion on this point which Professor James has not formulated but which seems to us quite in accord with the spirit of his teaching. We maintain that the more a given effort seems to us to increase, the greater is the number of muscles which contract in sympathy with it, and that the apparent consciousness of a greater intensity of effort at a given point of the organism is reducible, in reality to the perception of a larger surface of the body being affected. Our consciousness of an increase of muscular effort consists in the perception of one, a greater number of peripheral sensations, two, a qualitative change in some of them. Try, for example, to clench the fist with increasing force. You will have the impression of a sensation of effort entirely localized in your hand and running up a scale of magnitudes. In reality, what you experience in your hand remains the same, but the sensation which was at first localized there has affected your arm and ascended to the shoulder. Finally, the other arm stiffens. Both legs do the same. The respiration is checked. It is the whole body which is at work, but you fail to notice distinctly all these concomitant movements unless you are warned of them. Till then, you thought. You were dealing with a single state of consciousness, which changed in magnitude. When you press your lips more and more tightly against one another, you believe that you are experiencing in your lips one and the same sensation, which is continually increasing in strength. Here again, further reflection will show you that this sensation remains identical but that certain muscles of the face and the head and then of all the rest of the body have taken part in the operation. You felt this gradual encroachment, this increase of the surface affected, which is in truth a change of quantity. But as your attention was concentrated on your closed lips, you localized the increase there and you made the psychic force there expended into a magnitude although it possessed no extensity. Examine carefully somebody who is lifting heavier and heavier weights. The muscular contraction gradually spreads over his whole body. And as for the special sensation, which he experiences in the arm, which is at work, it remains constant for a very long time and hardly changes except in quality. The weight becoming at a certain moment fatigue and the fatigue pain yet the subject will imagine that he is conscious of a continual increase in the psychic force flowing into his arm. He will not recognize his mistake unless he is warned of it. So inclined is he to measure a given psychic state by the conscious movements which accompany it. From these facts and from many others of the same kind, we believe we can deduce the following conclusion. Our consciousness of an increase of muscular effort is reducible to the twofold perception of a greater number of peripheral sensations. 
and of a qualitative change occurring in some of them. The same definition of intensity applies to superficial efforts, deep-seated feelings, and states intermediate between the two. We are thus led to define the intensity of a superficial effort in the same way as that of a cases. There is a qualitative progress and an increase in complexity, indistinctly perceived. But consciousness, accustomed to think in terms of space and to translate its thoughts into words, will denote the feeling by a single word and will localize the effort at the exact point where it yields a useful result. It will then become aware of an effort which is always of the same nature and increases at the spot assigned to it, and a feeling which retaining the same name grows without changing its nature. Now the same illusion of consciousness is likely to be met with again in the case of the states which are intermediate between superficial efforts and deep-seated feelings. A large number of psychic states are accompanied, in fact, by muscular contractions and peripheral sensations. Sometimes these superficial elements are coordinated by a purely speculative idea, sometimes by an idea of a practical order. In the first case, there is intellectual effort or attention. In the second, we have the emotions which may be called violent or acute, anger, terror, and certain verities of joy, sorrow, passion, and desire. Let us show briefly that the same definition of intensity applies to these intermediate states. The intermediate states, attention and its relation to muscular contraction. Attention is not a purely physiological phenomenon, but we cannot deny that it is accompanied by movements. These movements are neither the cause nor the result of the phenomenon. They are part of it. They express it in terms of space, as Urbo has so remarkably proved. Fetchner had already reduced the effort of attention in a sense organ to the muscular feeling produced by putting in motion by a sort of reflex action the muscles which are correlated with the different sense organs. He had noticed the very distinct sensation of tension and contraction of the scalp, the pressure from without inwards over the whole skull, which we experience when we make a great effort to recall something. Ribo has studied more closely the movements which are characteristic of voluntary attention. Attention contracts the frontal muscle, this muscle draws the eyebrow towards itself, raises it, and causes transverse wrinkles on the forehead. In extreme cases, the mouth is opened wide. With children and with many adults, eager attention gives rise to, the, to a protrusion of the lips, a kind of pout. Certainly, a purely psychic factor will always enter into voluntary attention, even if it be nothing more than the exclusion by the will of all ideas foreign to the one with which the subject wishes to occupy himself. But once this exclusion is made, we believe that we are still conscious of a growing tension of soul, of an immaterial effort which increases. Analyze the impression and you will find nothing but the feeling of a muscular contraction which spreads over a wider surface or changes its nature, so that the tension becomes pressure, fatigue, and pain. The intensity of violent emotions as muscular tension. Now, we do not see any essential difference between the effort of attention and what may be the intensity called the effort of psychic tension. Acute desire, uncontrolled anger, passionate love, violent hatred, each of these states may be reduced, we believe, to a system of muscular contractions coordinated by an idea, but in the case of attention, it is the more or less reflective idea of knowing. In the case of emotion, the unreflective idea of acting. The intensity of these violent emotions 
is thus likely to be nothing but the muscular tension which accompanies them. Darwin has given a remarkable description of the physiological symptoms of rage. The action of the heart is much accelerated. The face reddens or may turn deadly pale. The respiration is labored. The chest heaves and the dilated nostrils quiver. The whole body often trembles. The voice is affected. The teeth are clenched or ground together. And the muscular system is commonly stimulated to violent, almost frantic action. The gestures represent more or less plainly the act of striking or fighting with an enemy. We shall not go so far as to maintain with Professor James that the emotion of rage is reducible to the sum of these organic sensations. There will always be an irreducible psychic element in anger if this be only the idea of striking or fighting of which Darwin speaks and which gives a common direction to so many diverse movements. But though this idea determines the direction of the emotional state and the accompanying movements, the growing intensity of the state itself is, we believe, nothing but the deeper and deeper disturbance of the organisms. A disturbance which consciousness has no difficulty in measuring by the number and extent of the bodily surfaces concerned. It will be useless to assert that there is a restrained rage which is all the more intense. The reason is that where emotion has free play, consciousness does not dwell on the details of the accompanying movements, but it does dwell upon them and is concentrated upon them when its object is to conceal them. Eliminate, in short, all trace of organic disturbance, all tendency towards muscular contraction, and all that will be left of anger will be the idea. For if you still insist on making it an emotion, you will be unable to assign it any intensity. Intensity and reflex movements. No essential difference between intensity of deep-seated feelings and that of violent emotions. Fear, when strong, says Herbert Spencer, expresses itself in cries, in efforts to escape, in palpitations and tremblings. We go further and maintain that these movements from part of the terror itself, by their means, the terror becomes an emotion capable of passing through different degrees of intensity. Suppress them entirely, and the more or less intense state of terror will be succeeded by an idea of terror, a wholly intellectual representation of a danger which it concerns us to avoid. There are also high degrees of joy and sorrow of desire, aversion and even shame, the height of which will be found to be nothing but the reflex movements begun by the organism and perceived by consciousness. When lovers meet, says Darwin, we know that their hearts beat quickly, their breathing is hurried and their faces flushed. Aversion is marked by movements of repugnance which we repeat without noticing when we think of the object of our dislike. We blush and involuntarily clench the fingers when we feel shame, even if it be retrospective. The acuteness of these emotions is estimated by the number and nature of the peripheral sensations which accompany them. Little by little, and in proportion, as the emotional state loses its violence and gains in depth, the peripheral sensations will give place to inner states. It will be no longer our outward movements, but our ideas, our memories, our states of consciousness of every description, which will turn in larger or smaller numbers in a definite direction. There is then no essential difference from the point of view of intensity between the deep-seated feelings of which we spoke at the beginning and the acute or violent emotions which we have just passed in review. To say that love, hatred, desire, increase in violence is to assert that they are projected outwards, that they radiate to the surface, that peripheral sensations are substituted for inner states. But superficial or deep-seated, violent or reflective, the intensity of these feelings always consists in the multiplicity of simple states, which consciousness dimly discerns in them. 
magnitude of sensations, affective and representative sensations. We have hitherto confined ourselves to feelings and efforts, complex states, the intensity of which does not absolutely depend on an external cause. But sensations seem to us simple states, and what will their magnitude consist? The intensity of sensations varies with the external cause of which they are said to be the conscious equivalent. How shall we explain the presence of quantity in an effect which is inextensive and in this case indivisible? To answer this question, we must first distinguish between the so called affective and the representative sensations. There is no doubt that we pass gradually from the one to the other and that some affective element enters into the majority of our simple representations. But nothing prevents us from isolating this element and inquiring separately in what does the intensity of an affective sensation, a pleasure, or a pain consist. Affective Sensations and Organic Disturbance Perhaps the difficulty of the latter problem is principally due to the fact that we are unwilling to see in the affective state anything but the conscious expression of an organic disturbance, the inward echo of an outward cause. We notice that a more intense sensation generally corresponds to a greater nervous disturbance, but inasmuch as these disturbances are unconscious as movements, since they come before consciousness, in the guise of a sensation which has no resemblance at all to motion, we do not see how they could transmit to the sensation anything of their own magnitude. For there is nothing in common, we repeat, between superposable magnitudes such as, for example, vibration amplitudes and sensations which do not occupy space. If the more intense sensation seems to us to contain the less intense, if it assumes for us, like the physical impression itself, the form of a magnitude, the reason probably is that it retains something of the physical impression to which it corresponds, and it will retain nothing of it if it is merely the conscious translation of a movement of molecules. For just because this movement is translated into the sensation of pleasure or pain, it remains unconscious as molecular movement. Pleasure and pain as signs of the future reaction rather than psychic translations of the past stimulus. But it might be asked whether pleasure and pain, instead of expressing only what has just occurred, or what is actually occurring in the organism, as is usually believed, could not also point out what is going to or what is tending to take place. It seems indeed somewhat improbable that nature so profoundly utilitarian should have here assigned to consciousness the merely scientific task of informing us about the past or the present, which no longer depend upon us. It must be noticed, in addition, that we rise by imperceptible stages from automatic to free movements, and that the latter differ from the former principally in introducing an effective sensation between the external action which occasions them and the volitional reaction which ensues. Indeed, all our actions might have been automatic, and we can surmise that there are many organized beings in whose case an external stimulus causes a definite reaction without calling up consciousness as an intermediate agent. If pleasure and pain make their appearance in certain privileged beings, it is probably to call forth a resistance to the automatic reaction which would have taken place. Either sensation has nothing to do or it is nascent freedom. But how would it enable us to resist the reaction which is in preparation if it did not acquaint us with the nature of the latter by some definite sign? And what can the sign be 
except the sketching and, as it were, the prefiguring of the future automatic movements in the very midst of the sensation which is being experienced. The affective state must then correspond not merely to the physical disturbances, movements, or phenomena which have taken place, but also and especially to those which are in preparation, those which are getting ready to be. Intensity of affective sensations would then be our consciousness of the involuntary movements tending to follow the stimulus. It is certainly not obvious at first sight how this hypothesis simplifies the problem, for we are trying to find what there can be in common from the point of view of magnitude between a physical phenomenon and a state of consciousness, and we seem to have merely turned the difficulty round by making the present state of consciousness a sign of the future reaction, rather than a psychic translation of the past stimulus. But the difference between the two hypotheses is considerable. For the molecular disturbances which were mentioned just now are necessarily unconscious, since no trace of the movements themselves can be actually perceived in the sensation which translates them. But the automatic movements which tend to follow the stimulus as its natural outcome are likely to be conscious as movements, or else the sensation itself whose function is to invite us to choose between this automatic reaction and other possible movements, would be of no avail. The intensity of affective sensations might thus be nothing more than our consciousness of the involuntary movements which are being begun and outlined, so to speak, within these states and which would have gone on in their own way if nature had made us automata instead of conscious beings. Intensity of a pain estimated by extent of organism affected. If such be the case, we shall not compare a pain of increasing intensity to a note which grows louder and louder, but rather to a symphony in which an increasing number of instruments make themselves heard. Within the characteristic sensation which gives the tone to all the others, consciousness distinguishes a larger or smaller number of sensations arising at different points of the periphery. Muscular contractions, organic movements of every kind, the choir of these elementary psychic states voices the new demands of the organism when confronted by a new situation. In other words, we estimate the intensity of a pain by the larger or smaller part of the organism which takes interest in it. Riche has observed that the slighter the pain, the more precisely is it referred to a particular spot. If it becomes more intense, it is referred to the whole of the member affected. And he concludes by saying that the pain spreads the proportion as it is more intense. We should rather reverse the sentence and define the intensity of the pain by the very number and extent of the parts of the body which sympathize with it and react, and whose reactions are perceived by consciousness. To convince ourselves of this, it will be enough to read the remarkable description of disgust given by the same author. If the stimulus is slight, there may be neither nausea nor vomiting. If the stimulus is stronger, instead of being confined to the pneumogastric nerve, it spreads and affects almost the whole organic system. The face turns pale, the smooth muscles of the skin contract, the skin is covered with a cold perspiration, the heart stops beating, in a word there is a general organic disturbance following the stimulation of the medulla oblongata. And this disturbance is the supreme expression of disgust. But is it nothing more than its expression? In what will the general sensation of disgust consist, if not in the sum of these elementary sensations? And what can we understand here by increasing intensity, if it is not the constantly increasing number of sensations which join in with the sensations already experienced? 
Darwin has drawn a striking picture of the reactions following a pain, which becomes more and more acute. Great pain urges all animals to make the most violent and diversified efforts to escape from the cause of suffering. With men, the mouth may be closely compressed, or more commonly, the lips are retracted with the teeth clenched or ground together. The eyes stare wildly, but the brows are heavily contracted. Perspiration bathes the body. The circulation and respiration are much affected. Now is it not by this very contraction of the muscles affected that we measure the intensity of a pain? Analyze your idea of any suffering which you call extreme. Do you not mean that it is unbearable? That is to say that it urges the organism to a thousand different actions in order to escape from it. I can picture to myself a nerve transmitting a pain which is independent of all automatic reaction. And I can equally understand that stronger or weaker stimulations influence this nerve differently. But I do not see how these differences of sensation would be interpreted by our consciousness as differences of quantity unless we connected them with the reactions which usually accompany them and which are more or less extended and more or less important. Without these subsequent reactions, the intensity of the pain would be a quality and not a magnitude. Pleasures compared by bodily inclination. We have hardly any other means of comparing several pleasures with one another. What do we mean by a greater pleasure except a pleasure that is preferred? And what can our preference be except a certain disposition of our organs? The effect of which is that when two pleasures are offered simultaneously to our mind, our body inclines towards one of them. Analyze the inclination itself and you will find a great many little movements which begin and become perceptible in the organs concerned, and even in the rest of the body as if the organism were coming forth to meet the pleasure as soon as it is pictured. When we define inclination as a movement, we are not using a metaphor. When confronted by several pleasures pictured by our mind, our body turns towards one of them spontaneously, as though by a reflex action. It rests with us to check it, but the attraction of the pleasure is nothing but this movement that is begun, and the very keenness of the pleasure while we enjoy it is merely the inertia of the organism, which is immersed in it and rejects every other sensation. Without this vis inertiae, of which we become conscious by the very resistance which we offer to anything that might distract us, pleasure would be a state, but no longer a magnitude. In the moral as in the physical world, attraction serves to define movement rather than to produce it. The intensity of representative sensations Many also effective, and intensity is measured by reaction called forth. In others, a new element enters. We have studied the effective sensations separately, but we must now notice that many representative sensations possess an effective character, and thus call forth a reaction on our part, which we take into account in estimating their intensity. A considerable increase of light is represented for us by a characteristic sensation which is not yet pain, but which is analogous to dazzling. In proportion, as the amplitude of sound vibrations increases, our head and then our body seem to us to vibrate or to receive a shock. Certain representative sensations, those of taste, smell, and temperature, have a fixed character of pleasantness or unpleasantness. Between flavors which are more or less bitter, you will hardly distinguish anything but differences of quality. They are like different shades of one and the same color. But these differences of quality are at once interpreted as differences of quantity because of their effective character and the more or less pronounced movements of reaction, pleasure or repugnance, which they suggest to us. Besides, even when the sensation remains purely representative, 
Its external cause cannot exceed a certain degree of strength or weakness without inciting us to movements which enable us to measure it. Sometimes, indeed, we have to make an effort to perceive this sensation, as if it were trying to escape notice. Sometimes, on the other hand, it obsesses us, forces itself upon us, and engrosses us to such an extent that we make every effort to escape from it and to remain ourselves. In the former case, the sensation is said to be of slight intensity, and in the latter case, very intense. Thus, in order to perceive a distant sound to distinguish what we call a faint smell or a dim light, we strain all our faculties, we pay attention, and it is just because the smell and the light thus require to be reinforced by our efforts that they seem to us feeble. And inversely, we recognize a sensation of extreme intensity by the irresistible reflex movements to which it incites us, or by the powerlessness with which it affects us. When a cannon is fired off close to our ears or a dazzling light suddenly flares up, we lose for an instant the consciousness of our personality. This state may even last some time in the case of a very nervous subject. It must be added that, even within the range of the so-called medium intensities, when we are dealing on even terms with a representative sensation, we often estimate its importance by comparing it with another which it drives away, or by taking account of the persistence with which it returns. Thus, the ticking of a watch seems louder at night because it easily monopolizes a consciousness almost empty of sensations and ideas. Foreigners talking to one another in a language we do not understand seem to us to speak very loudly, because their words no longer call up any ideas in our mind, and thus break in upon a kind of intellectual silence and monopolize our attention like the ticking of a watch at night. With these so-called medium sensations, however, we approach a series of psychic states, the intensity of which is likely to possess a new meaning, for in most cases the organism hardly reacts at all, at least in a way that can be perceived. And yet we still make a magnitude out of the pitch of a sound, the intensity of a light, the saturation of a color. Doubtless a closer observation of what takes place in the whole of the organism when we hear such and such a note or perceive such and such a color has more than one surprise in store for us. Has not C. Ferre shown that every sensation is accompanied by an increase in muscular force, which can be measured by the dynamometer? But of an increase of this kind, there is hardly any consciousness at all, and if we reflect on the precision with which we distinguish sounds and colors, nay, even weights and temperatures, we shall easily guess that some new element must come into play in our estimate of them. The purely representative sensations are measured by external causes. Now, the nature of this element is easy to determine. For in proportion, as a sensation loses its effective character and becomes representative, the reactions which it called forth on our part tend to disappear. But at the same time, we perceive the external object, which is its cause. Or if we do not now perceive it, we have perceived it, and we think of it. Now this cause is extensive and therefore measurable. A constant experience, which began with the first glimmerings of consciousness, and which continues throughout the whole of our life, shows us a definite shade of sensation corresponding to a definite amount of stimulation. We thus associate the idea of a certain quantity of cause with a certain quality of effect, and finally, as happens in the case of every acquired perception, we transfer the idea into the sensation, the quantity of the cause into the quality of the effect. At this very moment, the intensity, which was nothing but a certain shade or quality of the sensation, becomes a magnitude, 
We shall easily understand this process if, for example, we hold a pin in our right hand and prick our left hand more and more deeply. At first, we shall feel as it were a tickling, then a touch which is succeeded by a prick, then a pain localized at a point, and finally the spreading of this pain over the surrounding zone. And the more we reflect on it, the more clearly shall we see that we are here dealing with so many qualitatively distinct sensations, so many varieties of a single species, but yet we spoke at first of one and the same sensation which spread further and further, of one prick which increased in intensity. The reason is that without noticing it, we localized in the sensation of the left hand, which is pricked, the progressive effort of the right hand, which pricks. We thus introduced the cause into the effect and unconsciously interpreted quality as quantity, intensity as magnitude. Now it is easy to see that the intensity of every representative sensation ought to be understood in the same way. The sensations of sound, intensity measured by effort necessary to produce a similar sound. The sensations of sound display well-marked degrees of intensity. We have already spoken of the necessity of taking into account the affective character of these sensations. The shock received by the whole of the organism, we have shown that a very intense sound is one which engrosses our attention which supplants all the others. But take away the shock, the well-marked vibration which you sometimes feel in your head or even throughout your body, take away the clash which takes place between sounds heard simultaneously. What will be left except an indefinable quality of the sound which is heard? But this quality is immediately interpreted as quantity because you have obtained it yourself a thousand times, e.g. by striking some object and thus expending a definite quantity of effort. You know, to how far you would have to raise your voice to produce a similar sound. And the idea of this effort immediately comes into your mind when you transform the intensity of the sound into a magnitude. Vunt has drawn attention to the quite special connections of vocal and auditory nervous filaments which are met with in the human brain, and has it not been said that to hear is to speak to oneself. Some neuropaths cannot be present at a conversation without moving their lips. This is only an exaggeration of what takes place in the case of every one of us. How will the expressive or rather suggestive power of music be explained, if not by admitting that we repeat to ourselves the sounds heard, so as to carry ourselves back into the psychic state, out of which they emerged, an original state which nothing will express, but which something may suggest, viz. the very motion and attitude which the sound imparts to our body. Intensity and pitch, the part played by muscular effort. Thus, when we speak of the intensity of a sound of medium force as a magnitude, we allude principally to the greater or less effort which we should have ourselves to expend in order to summon, by our own effort, the same auditory sensation. Now, besides the intensity, we distinguish another characteristic property of the sound, its pitch. Are the differences in pitch, such as our ear perceives, quantitative differences? I grant that a sharper sound calls up the picture of a higher position in space. But does it follow from this that the notes of the scale as auditory sensations differ otherwise than in quality. Forget what you have learnt from physics. Examine carefully your idea of a higher or lower note, and see whether you do not think simply of the greater or less effort which the tensor muscle of your vocal cords has to make in order to produce the note. 
as the effort by which your voice passes from one note to another is discontinuous, you picture to yourself these successive notes as points in space to be reached by a series of sudden jumps in each of which you cross an empty separating interval. This is why you establish intervals between the notes of the scale. Now, why is the line along which we dispose them vertical rather than horizontal? And why do we say that the sound ascends in some cases and descends in others? It must be remembered that the high notes seem to us to produce some sort of resonance in the head and the deep notes in the thorax. This perception, whether real or illusory, has undoubtedly had some effect in making us reckon the intervals vertically. But we must also notice that the greater the tension of the vocal cords in the chest voice, the greater is the surface of the body affected. If the singer is inexperienced, this is just the reason why the effort is felt by him as more intense. And as he breathes out the air, he will attribute the same direction to the sound produced by the current of air, hence the sympathy of a larger part of the body with the vocal muscles will be represented by a movement upwards. We shall thus say that the note is higher because the body makes an effort as though to reach an object which is more elevated in space. In this way, it became customary to assign a certain height to each note of the scale, and as soon as the physicist was able to define it by the number of vibrations in a given time to which it corresponds, we no longer hesitated to declare that our ear perceived differences of quantity directly, but the sound would remain a pure quality if we did not bring in the muscular effort which produces it or the vibrations which explain it. The sensations of heat and cold, these soon become effective and are measured by reactions called forth. The experiments of Blix and Goldscheider and Donaldson have shown that the points on the surface of the body which feel cold are not the same as those which feel heat. Physiology is thus disposed to set up a distinction of nature and not merely of degree between the sensations of heat and cold. But psychological observation goes further, for close attention can easily discover specific differences between the different sensations of heat as also between the sensations of cold. A more intense heat is really another kind of heat. We call it more intense because we have experienced this same change a thousand times when we approach nearer and nearer a source of heat or when a growing surface of our body was affected by it. Besides, the sensations of heat and cold very quickly become effective and incite us to more or less marked reactions by which we measure their external cause. Hence, we are inclined to set up similar quantitative differences among the sensations which correspond to lower intensities of the cause. But I shall not insist any further. Everyone must question himself carefully on this point after making a clean sweep of everything which his past experience has taught him about the cause of his sensations and coming face to face with the sensations themselves. The result of this examination is likely to be as follows. It will be perceived that the magnitude of a representative sensation depends on the cause having been put into the effect, while the intensity of the affective element depends on the more or less important reactions which prolong the external stimulations and find their way into the sensation itself. The cessation of pressure and weight measured by extent of organism affected. The same thing will be experienced in the case of pressure and even weight. When you say that a pressure on your hand becomes stronger, see whether you do not mean that there first was a contact, then a pressure, afterwards a pain, 
and that this pain itself, after having gone through a series of qualitative changes, has spread further and further over the surrounding region. Look again and see whether you do not bring in the more and more intense, i.e. more and more extended effort of resistance, which you oppose to the external pressure. When the psychophysicist lifts a heavier weight, he experiences, he, is, he says, an increase of sensation. Examine whether this increase of sensation ought not rather to be called a sensation of increase. The whole question is centered in this. For in the first case, the sensation would be a quantity, like its external cause, whilst in the second, it would be a quality which had become representative of the magnitude of its cause. The distinction between the heavy and the light may seem to be as old-fashioned and as childish as that between the hot and the cold, but the very childishness of this distinction makes it, psycho makes it a psychological reality. And not only do the heavy and the light impress our consciousness as generically different, but the various degrees of lightness and heaviness are so many species of these two genera. It must be added that the difference of quality is here translated spontaneously into a difference of quantity, because of the more or less extended effort which our body makes in order to lift a given weight. Of this you will soon become aware if you are asked to lift a basket which you are told is full of scrap iron, whilst in fact there is nothing in it. You will think you are losing your balance when you catch hold of it, as though distant muscles had interested themselves beforehand in the operation and experienced a sudden disappointment. It is chiefly by the number and nature of these sympathetic efforts which take place at different points of the organism that you measure the sensation of weight at a given point. And this sensation would be nothing more than a quality if you did not thus introduce into it the idea of a magnitude. What strengthens the illusion on this point is that we have become accustomed to believe in the immediate perception of a homogeneous movement in a homogeneous space. When I lift a light weight with my arm, all the rest of my body remains remaining motionless. I experience a series of muscular sensations, each of which has its local sign, its peculiar shade. It is this series which my consciousness interprets as a continuous movement in space. If I afterwards lift a heavier weight to the same height, at the same speed, I pass through a new series of muscular sensations, each of which differs from the corresponding term of the preceding series. Of this, I could easily convince myself by examining them closely, but as I interpret this new series, also a continuous movement, and as this movement has the same direction, the same duration, and the same velocity, as the proceeding, my consciousness feels itself bound to localize the difference between the second series of sensations and the first elsewhere than in the movement itself. It thus materializes this difference as the extremity of the arm which moves. It persuades itself that the sensation of movement has been identical in both cases. While the sensation of weight differed in magnitude, but movement and weight are but distinctions of the reflective consciousness. What is present to consciousness immediately is the sensation of, so to speak, a heavy movement, and this sensation itself can be resolved by analysis into a series of muscular sensations, each of which represents by its shade its place of origin and by its color the magnitude of the weight lifted. The sensation of light, qualitative changes of color, interpreted as quantitative changes in intensity of luminous source. Shall we call the intensity of light a quantity or shall we treat it as a quality? It has not perhaps been sufficiently noticed what a large number of different factors cooperate in daily life in giving us information about the nature of the luminous source. We know from long experience that when we have a difficulty in distinguishing the outlines and details of objects, the light is at a distance or on the point of going out. Experience has taught us that the effective sensation or nascent dazzling that we experience in certain cases must be attributed to a higher intensity of the cause. Any increase or diminution in the number of luminous sources alters the way in which the sharp lines of bodies stand out 
and also the shadows which they project. Still more important are the changes of hue which colored surfaces and even the pure colors of the spectrum undergo under the influence of a brighter or yellow and a and red a brilliant yellow. Inversely, when the light is moved away, ultramarine passes into violet and yellow into green. Finally, red, green, and violet tend to become a whitish yellow. Physicists have remarked these changes of hue for some time, but what is still more remarkable is that the majority of men do not perceive them unless they pay attention to them or are warned of them. Having made up our mind once for all to interpret changes of quality as changes of quantity, we begin by asserting that every object has its own peculiar color, definite and invariable. And when the hue of objects tends to become yellow or blue, instead of saying that we see their color change under the influence of an increased or diminution of light, we assert that the color remains the same, but that our sensation of luminous intensity increases or diminishes. We thus substitute once more for the quantitative impression received by our consciousness, the quantitative interpretation given by our understanding. Helmholtz has described a case of interpretation of the same kind, but still more complicated. If we form white with two colors of the spectrum, and if we increase or diminish the intensities of the two colored lights in the same ratio, so that the proportions of the combination remain the same, the resultant color remains the same, although the relative intensity of the sensations undergoes a marked change. This depends on the fact that the light of the sun, which we consider as the normal white light during the day, itself undergoes similar modifications of shade when the luminous intensity varies. Does experiment prove that we can measure directly our sensations of light? But yet, if we often judge of variations in the luminous source by the relative changes of hue of the objects which surround us, this is no longer the case in simple instances where a single object, e.g. a white surface, passes successively through different degrees of luminosity. We are bound to insist particularly on this last point. For the physicist speaks of degrees of luminous intensity as of real quantities, and in fact he measures them by the photometer. The psychophysicist goes still further. He maintains that our eye itself estimates the intensities of light. Experiments have been attempted at first by de Boeuf and afterwards by Lehman and Niglick with the view of constructing a psychological formula from the direct measurement of our luminous sensations. Of these experiments, we shall not dispute the result, nor shall we deny the value of photometric processes but we must see how we have to interpret them. Photometric experiments, we perceive different shades and afterwards interpret them as decreasing intensities of white light. Look closely at a sheet of paper lighted e.g. by four candles and put out in succession one, two, photometric three of them. You say that the surface remains white and that its brightness diminishes but you are aware that one candle has just been put out. Or if you do not know it, you have often observed a similar change in the appearance of a white surface when the illumination was diminished. Put aside what you remember of your past experiences and what you are accustomed to say of the present ones. You will find that what you really perceive is not a diminished illumination of the white surface. It is a layer of shadow passing over the surface at the moment the candle is extinguished. This shadow is a reality to your consciousness, like the light itself. If you call the first surface in all its brilliancy white, you will have to give another name to what you now see, for it is a different thing. It is, if we may say so, a new shade of white. We have grown accustomed through the combined influence of our past experience and of physical theories to regard black as the absence, or at least as the minimum, of luminous sensation and the successive shades of gray as decreasing intensities of white light. 
But in point of fact, black has just as much reality for our consciousness as white. And the decreasing intensities of white light illuminating a given surface would appear to an unprejudiced consciousness as so many different shades, not unlike the various colors of the spectrum. This is the reason why the change in the sensation is not continuous, as it is in the external cause, and why the light can increase or decrease for a certain period without producing any apparent change in the illumination of our white surface. The illumination will not appear to change until the increase or decrease of the external light is sufficient to produce a new quality. The variations in brightness of a given color, the effective sensations of which we have spoken above being left aside, would thus be nothing but qualitative changes. Were it not our custom to transfer the cause to the effect and to replace our immediate impressions by what we learn from experience and science, the same thing might be said of degrees of saturation. Indeed, if the different intensities of a color correspond to so many different shades existing between this color and black, the degrees of saturation are like shades intermediate between this same color and pure white. Every color, we might say, can be regarded under two aspects, from the point of view of black and from the point of view of white, and black is then to intensity what white is to saturation. In photometric experiments, the physicist compares not sensations but physical effects. The meaning of the photometric experiments will now be understood. A candle placed at a certain distance from a sheet of paper illuminates it in a certain way. You double the distance and find that four candles are required to produce the same effect sensation. From this, you conclude that if you had doubled the distance without increasing the intensity of the luminous source, the resultant illumination would have been only one-fourth as bright. But it is quite obvious that you are here dealing with the physical and not the psychological effect, for it cannot be said that you have compared two sensations with one another. You have made use of a single sensation in order to compare two different luminous sources with each other, the second four times as strong as the first but twice as far off. In a word, the physicist never brings in sensations which are twice or three times as great as others, but only identical sensations. Destined to serve as intermediaries between two physical quantities, which can then be equated with one another. The sensation of light here plays the part of the auxiliary unknown quantity, which the mathematician introduces into his calculations, and which is not intended to appear in the final result. The psychophysicist claims to compare and measure sensation de both experiments. But the object of the psychophysicist is entirely different. It is the sensation of light itself, which he studies and claims to measure. Sometimes he will proceed to integrate infinitely small differences after the method of Fechner. Sometimes he will compare one sensation directly with another. The latter method, due to Plateau and de Boeuf, differs far less than has hitherto been believed from Fechner's, but as it bears more especially on the luminous sensations, we shall deal with it first. De Boeuf places an observer in front of three concentric rings which vary in brightness by an ingenious arrangement. He can cause each of these rings to pass through all the shades intermediate between white and black. Let us suppose that two hues of gray are simultaneously produced on two of the rings and kept unchanged. Let us call them A and B. De Boeuf alters the brightness C of the third ring and asks the observer to tell him whether at a certain moment the gray B appears to him equally distant from the other two. A moment comes, in fact, when the observer states that the contrast AB is equal to the contrast BC. So that, according to DeBoeuf, a scale of luminous intensities could be constructed on which we might pass from each sensation to the following one by equal sensible contrasts. Our sensations would thus be measured by one another. I shall not follow DeBoeuf into the conclusions which he has drawn from these remarkable experiments. The essential question, the only question, as it seems to me, 
is whether a contrast AB formed of the elements A and B is really equal to a contrast BC, which is differently composed. As soon as it is proved that two sensations can be equal without being identical, psychophysics will be established. But it is this equality which seems to me open to question. It is easy to explain, in fact, how a sensation of luminous intensity can be said to be at an equal distance from two others. This is just the case with differences of intensity in sensations of light. De Boeuf's underlying postulate. Now, if the views which we have before enumerated with regard to luminous intensities are accepted, it will be recognized that the different hues of gray which de Boeuf displays to us are strictly analogous. For our consciousness to colors and that if we declare that a gray tint is equidistant from two other gray tints, it is in the same sense in which it might be said that orange, for example, is at an equal distance from green and red. But there is this difference, that in all our past experience, the succession of gray tints has been produced in connection with a progressive increase or decrease in illumination. Hence, we do for the differences of brightness what we do not think of doing for the differences of color. We promote the changes of quality into variations of magnitude. Indeed, there is no difficulty here about the measuring because the successive shades of gray produced by a continuous decrease of illumination are discontinuous. As being qualities, and because we can count approximately the principal intermediate shades, which separate any two kinds of gray, the contrast AB will thus be declared equal to the contrast BC when our imagination, aided by our memory, inserts A and B the same number of intermediate shades as between B and C. It is needless to say that this will necessarily be a very rough estimate. We may anticipate that it will vary considerably with different persons. Above all, it is to be expected that the person will show more hesitation and that the estimates of different persons will differ more widely in proportion as the differences in brightness between the rings A and B is increased. For more and more laborious effort will be required to estimate the number of intermediate hues. This is exactly what happens, as we shall easily perceive by glancing at the two tables drawn up by de Boeuf. In proportion, as he increases the difference in brightness between the exterior ring and the middle ring, the difference between the numbers on which one and the same observer or different observers successively fix increases almost continuously from 3 degrees to 94, from 5 to 73, from 10 to 25, from 7 to 40. But let us leave these divergences on one side. Let us assume that the observers are always consistent and always agree with one another. Will it then be established that the contrasts AB and BC are equal? It would first be necessary to prove that two successive elementary contrasts are equal quantities. Whilst in fact, we only know that they are successive, it would then be necessary to prove that inside a given tint of gray, we perceive the less intense shades, which our imagination has run through in order to estimate the objective intensity of the source of light. In a word, de Boeuf's psychophysics assumes a theoretical postulate of the greatest importance which is disguised under the cloak of an experimental result, and which we should formulate as follows. When the objective quantity of light is continuously increased, the differences between the hues of gray successively obtained, each of which represents the smallest perceptible increase of physical stimulation, are qualities equal to one another, and besides any one of the sensations obtained, can be equated with the sum of the differences which separate from one another all previous sensations going from zero upwards. Now, this is just the postulate of Fechner's psychophysics, which we are going to examine. Fechner's psychophysics, Weber's law. Fechner took as his starting point a law discovered by Weber, according to which, given a certain stimulus which calls forth a certain sensation, 
the amount by which the stimulus must be increased for consciousness to become aware of any change bears a fixed relation to the original stimulus. Thus, if we denote by E the stimulus which corresponds to the sensation S, and by delta E the amount by which the original stimulus must be increased in order that a sensation of difference may be produced, we shall have delta E slash E equals constant. This formula has been much modified by the disciples of Fetchner, and we prefer to take no part in the discussion. It is for experiment to decide between the relation established by Weber and its substitutes, nor shall we raise any difficulty about granting the probable existence of a law of this nature. It is here really a question not of measuring a sensation, but only of determining the exact moment at which an increase of stimulus produces a change in it. Now, if a definite amount of stimulus produces a definite shade of sensation, it is obvious that the minimum amount of stimulus required to produce a change in this shade is also definite. And since it is not constant, it must be a function of the original stimulus. But how are we to pass from a relation between the stimulus and its minimum increase to an equation which connects the amount of sensation with the corresponding stimulus. The whole of psychophysics is involved in this transition, which is therefore worthy of our closest consideration. The underlying assumptions and the process by which Fechner's law is reached. We shall distinguish several different artifices in the process of transition from Weber's experiments or from any other series of similar observations, to a psychophysical law like Fechner's, it is first of all agreed to consider our consciousness of an increase of stimulus as an increase of the sensation S. This is therefore called S. It is then asserted that all the sensations delta S, which correspond to the smallest perceptible increase of stimulus, are equal to one another. They are sensations delta s which correspond to the smallest perceptible increase of stimulus are equal to one another they are therefore treated as quantities and while on the other hand these quantities are supposed to be always equal and on the other experiment has given a certain relation delta e equals e between the stimulus e and its minimum increase the constancy of delta S is expressed by writing delta S equals C delta E slash E, C being a constant quantity. Finally, it is agreed to replace the very small differences delta S and delta E by the infinitely small differences D, S, and D, E, whence an equation, which is this time a differential one, D, S, equals C, D, E, slash E. We shall now simply have to integrate on both sides to obtain the desired relations S equals C to the E, sub O, D, E, slash E. And the transition will thus be made from a proved law which only concerned the occurrence of a sensation to an unprovable law which gives its measure. Without entering upon any thorough discussion of this ingenious operation, let us show in a few words how Fetchner has grasped the real difficulty of the problem, how he has tried to overcome it, and where, as it seems to us, the flaw in his reasoning lies. Can two sensations be equal without being identical? Fetchner realized that measurement could not be introduced into psychology without first defining what is meant by the equality and addition of two simple states, e.g. two sensations, but unless they are identical, we do not at first see how two sensations can be equal. Undoubtedly, in the physical world, equality is not synchronous with identity. But the reason is that every phenomenon, every object is there presented under two aspects, the one qualitative and the other extensive. 
nothing prevents us from putting the first one aside, and then there remains nothing but terms which can be directly or indirectly superposed on one another and consequently seen to be identical. Now, this qualitative element, which we begin by eliminating from external objects in order to measure them, is the very thing which psychophysics retains and claims to measure. And it is no use trying to measure this quality Q by some physical quantity Q prime, which lies beneath it, for it would be necessary to have previously shown that Q is a function of Q prime, and this would not be possible unless the quality Q has first been measured with some fraction of itself. Thus, nothing prevents us from measuring the sensation of heat by the degree of temperature, but this is only a convention. And the whole point of psychophysics lies in rejecting this convention and seeking how the sensation of heat varies when you change the temperature. In a word, it seems, on the one hand, that two different sensations cannot be said to be equal unless some identical residuum remains after the elimination of their qualitative difference. But on the other hand, this qualitative difference being all that we perceive, it does not appear what could remain once it was eliminated. Fetchner's Method of Minimum Differences The novel feature in Fetchner's treatment is that he did not consider this difficulty insurmountable, taking advantage of the fact that sensation varies by sudden jumps while the stimulus increases continuously. He did not hesitate to call these differences of sensation by the same name. They are all, he says, minimum differences since each corresponds to the smallest perceptible increase in the external stimulus. Therefore, you can set aside the specific shade or quality of these successive differences. A common residuum will remain in virtue of which they will be seen to be in a manner identical. They all have the common character of being a minima. Such will be the definition of a quality which we were seeking. Now the definition of addition will follow naturally. For if we treat as a quantity the difference perceived by consciousness between two sensations which succeed one another in the course of continuous increase of stimulus, if we call the first sensation S and the second S plus delta S, we shall have to consider every sensation S as a sum obtained by the addition of the minimum differences through which we pass before reaching it. The only remaining step will then be to utilize the twofold definition in order to establish, first of all, a relation between the differences delta S and delta E, and then through the substitution of the differentials between the two variables. True, the mathematicians may hear large protests against the substitution of differential for difference. The psychologist may ask, too, whether the quantity delta S, instead of being constant, does not vary as the sensation S itself. Finally, taking the psychophysical law for granted, we may all debate about its real meaning, but by the mere fact that delta S is regarded as a quantity and S as a sum, the fundamental postulate of the whole process is accepted. Breakdown of the assumption that the sensation is a sum and the minimum differences quantities. Now it is just this postulate which seems to us open to question even if it can be understood, assume that I experience a sensation S and that increasing the stimulus continuously, I perceive this increase after a certain time. I am now notified of the increase of the cause. But why should I call this notification an arithmetical difference? No doubt the notification consists in the fact that the original state S has changed. It has become S prime. But the transition from S to S prime could only be called an arithmetical difference if I were conscious, so to speak, of an interval between S and S prime. And if my sensation were felt to rise from S to S prime by the addition of something, by giving this transition a name, by calling it delta S, you make it first a reality and then a quantity. Now, not only are you unable to explain in what sense this transition is a quantity, but reflection will show you that it is not even a reality. The only realities are the states S and S prime through which I pass. No doubt if S and S prime were numbers, 
that could assert the reality of the differences S prime, S even though S and S prime alone were given. The reason is that the number S prime S, which is a certain sum of units, will then represent just the successive moments of the additions by which we pass from S to S prime. But if S and S prime are simple states, and what will the interval which separates them consist? And what then can the transition from the first state to the second be, if not a mere act of your thought, which arbitrarily and for the sake of argument assimilates a succession of two states to a differentiation of two magnitudes? We can speak of arithmetical difference only in a conventional sense. Either you keep to what consciousness presents to you, or you have recourse to a conventional mode of representation. In the first case, you will find a difference between S and S prime, like that between the shades sense of rainbow and not at all an interval of magnitude. In the second case, you may introduce the symbol delta S if you like, but it is only in a conventional sense that you will speak here of an arithmetical difference and in a conventional sense also that you will assimilate a sensation to a sum. The most acute of Fechner critics, Jules Tannery, has made the latter point perfectly clear. It will be said, for example, that a sensation of 50 degrees is expressed by the number of differential sensations, which would succeed one another from the point where sensation is absent up to the sensation of 50 degrees. I do not see that this is anything but a definition which is as legitimate as it is arbitrary. De Boeuf's results seem more plausible, but in the end, all psychophysics revolves in a vicious circle. We do not believe, in spite of all that has been said, that the method of mean gradations has set psychophysics on a new path. The novel feature of De Boeuf's investigation was that he chose a particular case in which consciousness seemed to decide in Fechner's favor, and in which common sense itself played the part of the psychophysicist. He inquired whether certain sensations did not appear to us immediately as equal, although different, and whether it would not be possible to draw up, by their help, a table of sensations which were double, triple, or quadruple those which preceded them. The mistake which Fechner made, as we have just seen, was that he believed in an interval between two successive sensations, S and S prime, when there is simply a passing from one to the other and not a difference in the arithmetical sense of the word. But if the two terms between which the passing takes place could be given simultaneously, there would then be a contrast besides the transition, and although the contrast is not yet an arithmetical difference, it resembles it in a certain respect, for the two terms which are compared stand here, side by side, as in a case of subtraction of two numbers. Suppose now that these sensations belong to the same genus, and that in our past experience, we have constantly been present at their march past, so to speak, while the physical stimulus increased continuously. It is extremely probable that we shall thrust the cause into the effect, and that the idea of contrast will thus melt into that of arithmetical difference, as we shall have noticed, moreover, that the sensation changed abruptly while the stimulus rose continuously. We shall no doubt estimate the distance between two given sensations by a rough guess at the number of these sudden jumps, or at least of the intermediate sensations which usually serve us as landmarks. To sum up the contrast will appear to us as a difference, the stimulus as a quantity, the sudden jump as an element of equality combining these three factors. We shall reach the idea of equal quantitative differences. Now these conditions are nowhere so well realized as when surfaces of the same color, more or less illuminated, are simultaneously presented to us. Not only is there here a contrast between similar sensations, but these sensations correspond to a cause whose influence 
has always been felt by us to be closely connected with its distance. And as this distance can vary continuously, we cannot have escaped noticing in our past experience a vast number of shades of sensation which succeeded one another along with the continuous increase of the cause. We are therefore able to say that the contrast between one shade of gray and another, for example, seems to us almost equal to the contrast between the latter and a third one. And if we define two equal sensations by saying that they are sensations which a more or less confused process of reasoning interprets as such, we shall, in fact, reach a law like that proposed by de Boeuf. But it must not be forgotten that consciousness has here passed through the same intermediate steps as the psychophysicist, that it's, and that its judgment is worth here just what psychophysics is worth. It is a symbolical interpretation of quality as quantity, a more or less rough estimate of the number of sensations which can come in between two given sensations. The difference is thus not as great as is believed between the method of least noticeable differences and that of mean gradations, between the psychophysics of Fechner and that of Delboeuf. The first led to a conventional measurement of sensation. The second appeals to common sense in the particular cases where common sense adopts a similar convention. In a word, all psychophysics is condemned by its origin to revolve in a vicious circle, for the theoretical postulate on which it rests condemns it to experimental verification, and it cannot be experimentally verified unless its postulate is first granted. The fact is that there is no point of contact between the unextended and the extended, between quality and quantity. We can interpret the one by the other, set up the one as the equivalent of the other, but sooner or later, at the beginning or at the end, we shall have to recognize the conventional character of this assimilation. Psychophysics merely pushes to its extreme consequences the fundamental but natural mistake of regarding sensations as magnitudes. In truth, psychophysics merely formulates with precision and pushes to its extreme consequences a conception familiar to common sense. As speech dominates over thought as external objects, which are common to us all, are more important to us than the subjective states through which each of us passes. We have everything to gain by objectifying these states, by introducing into them to the largest possible extent the representation of their external cause. And the more our knowledge increases, the more we perceive the extensive behind the intensive, quantity behind quality, the more also we tend to thrust the former into the latter and to treat our sensations as magnitudes. Physics, whose particular function it is to calculate the external cause of our internal states, takes the least possible interest in these states themselves. Constantly and deliberately, it confuses them with their cause. It thus encourages and even exaggerates the mistake which common sense makes on the point. The moment was inevitably bound to come at which science familiarized with this confusion between quality and quantity, between sensation and stimulus, should seek to measure the one as it measures the other. Such was the object of psychophysics. In this bold attempt, Fechner was encouraged by his adversaries themselves, by the philosophers who speak of intensive magnitudes while declaring that psychic states cannot be submitted to measurement. For if we grant that one sensation can be stronger than another, and that this inequality is inherent in the sensations themselves, independently of all association of ideas, of all more or less conscious consideration of number and space, it is natural to ask by how much the first sensation exceeds the second, and to set up a quantitative relation between their intensities. Nor is it any use to reply, as the opponents of psychophysics sometimes do, that all measurement implies superposition, 
and that there is no occasion to seek for a numerical relation between intensities, which are not superposable objects, for it will then be necessary to explain why one sensation is said to be more intense than another, and how the conceptions of greater and smaller can be applied to things which it has just been acknowledged, do not admit among themselves of the relations of container to contain. If in order to cut short any question of this kind, we distinguish two kinds of quantity, the one intensive which admits only of a more or less, the other extensive which lends itself to measurement, we are not far from siding with Fetchner and the psychophysicists. For as soon as a thing is acknowledged to be capable of increase and decrease, it seems natural to ask by how much it decreases or by how much it increases. And because a measurement of this kind does not appear to be possible directly, it does not follow that science cannot successfully accomplish it by some indirect process, either by an integration of infinitely small elements as Fetchner proposes, or by any other roundabout way. Either then sensation is pure quality, or if it is a magnitude, we ought to try to measure it. Thus, intensity judged one in representative states by an estimate of the magnitude of the cause, two in effective states by a multiplicity of psychic phenomena involved. To sum up what proceeds, we have found the notion of intensity to present itself under a double aspect, according as we study the states of consciousness, which represent an external cause, or those which are self-sufficient. In the former case, the perception of intensity consists in a certain estimate of the magnitude of the cause means of a certain quality in the effect. It is, as the Scottish philosophers would have said, an acquired perception. In the second case, we give the name of intensity to the larger or smaller number of simple psychic phenomena, which we conjecture to be involved in the fundamental state. It is no longer an acquired perception, but a confused perception. In fact, these two meanings of the word usually intermingle, because the simpler phenomena involved in an emotion or an effort are generally representative. And because the majority of representative states, being at the same time effective themselves, include a multiplicity of elementary psychic phenomena. The idea of intensity is thus situated at the junction of two streams one of which brings us the idea of extensive magnitude from without, while the other brings us from within, in fact, from the very depths of consciousness, the image of an inner multiplicity. Now the point is to determine in what the latter image consists, whether it is the same as that of number or whether it is quite different from it. In the following chapter, we shall no longer consider states of consciousness in isolation from one another, but in their concrete multiplicity, insofar as they unfold themselves in pure duration, and in the same way as we have asked what would be the intensity of a representative sensation if we did not introduce into it the idea of its cause. We shall now have to inquire what the multiplicity of our inner states becomes, what form duration assumes, when the space in which it unfolds is eliminated, this second question is even more important than the first. For if the confusion of quality with quantity were confined to each of the phenomena of consciousness taken separately, it would give rise to obscurities, as we have just seen, rather than to problems. But by invading the series of our psychic states, by introducing space into our perception of duration, it corrupts at its very source our feeling of outer and inner change, of movement and of freedom, hence the paradoxes of the Eleatics, hence the problem of free will. We shall insist rather on the second point, but instead of seeking to solve the question, we shall show the mistake of those who ask it.